Hi, welcome. Thank you all for joining this webinar about artificial intelligence and how the MAX78000 Neural Network Accelerator from Maxim Integrated can be used to make AI applications a reality. Now, my name is Clemens Valens and I will be moderating today. Artificial intelligence, as you know, is the hype of today. It is all over the internet, on TV and in every newspaper. You have probably seen deepfake videos made with AI and you may uh, even own a personal assistant that recognizes what you say to it and then plays your favorite music or turns on the lights. Uh, the MAX78000 Neural Network Accelerator is targeted at these kinds of applications. At the devices and gadgets near and around you or even on you in the case of wearables. It adds AI capabilities to low power devices without needing a connection to the internet. In this webinar, Brian Rush from Maxim Integrated will present both the Max78000 and the development module used in the contest. In the contest, uh, yes, indeed, because the Max78000 is such an interesting device, uh, Elector and Maxim together organize, organize a design contest around it. Use the Max78000 in a creative project, document your work and enter it before June 30, 2021. Up to 3,500 euros in prize money can be won, and the best entry will be rewarded with 2,000 euros in cash. But that's not all now. To get you started, we run a pre-contest in which you can win a free Max 78000 feather board that will be helpful for doing your contest project. All you have to do is fill in a form and briefly describe the applications you have in mind. This must be done before April 15, 2021, which means that you have two weeks. The content details uh, are on this page. Uh, the link to the URL is here as well. But I suggest uh, reading this after the webinar and not during, because otherwise you will miss important uh, background information that Brian Rush is about to give you. When Brian has finished his presentation, uh, there will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions by typing them in the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. So here we go. Thank you and welcome to this webinar on the Max 78000 Featherboard. I'm glad to be talking to you today. You might know Maxim for power management, security, or interface products, but we have also introduced the first true AI at the edge processor with a custom design CNN accelerator for battery powered AI. The Max 78000 is a revolutionary product that brings AI to the world of small battery powered devices. The Max 78000 Featherboard has a small footprint, but is feature packed and a great platform creating for creating small intelligent things. I will be spending the next few minutes on the Max 78000 IC, the Max 78000 Featherboard, showing some of the things they can do, then talking about possible projects and considerations in terms of data sets and models. I'll close with sharing links to key resources to get you started with the Max 78000. The most important being product documentation on maximintegrated.com and development tools, example models, and embedded code on our Maxim Integrated AI GitHub repos. Before we dive in, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge the significance of the time we are experiencing confluence of advances in deep neural networks, semiconductor process technology, and IC design innovation mean we can now do things that were impossible only a few years ago. You are on the forefront of this exciting transformation. Machines, small, inexpensive, and battery powered, can now see, hear, and sense the world around them and make decisions in some cases almost as well as humans. It starts with data rich sensors like cameras and microphones, sometimes both. The level of intelligence to process these inputs to see and hear is too demanding for traditional human engineered machine learning. To accurately recognize objects or words requires a properly trained deep neural network. Thankfully, deep neural networks have advanced rapidly, and convolutional neural networks are the workhorses of DNNs. But with many layers of matrix math, CNNs are computationally expensive, 
millions, sometimes billions, of math operations are required to recognize a simple keyword or classify a low-resolution image. These computations consist mostly of multiply and accumulate operations, and each consumes energy. And with so many calculations to perform, running AI on a battery-powered microcontroller has until recently resulted in disappointment, having to change or recharge the battery too often to make AI on a battery practical. We built the Mac 78000 specifically to meet this challenge. Starting with a low-power microcontroller platform capable of running for weeks on a small battery, the Mac 78000 includes a novel CNN accelerator. The architecture minimizes data movement, maximizes parallelism, and optimizes energy use. All weight, bias, and data memories are contained within the accelerator's computation blocks. The hardware autonomously executes a CNN operation layer by layer from start to finish. So except for loading input data with an image or audio segment and starting the inference, the accelerator operates completely independent of microcontroller control. In contrast to MCUs, DSPs, and GPUs, no energy is spent fetching instructions because the Mac 78000 accelerator doesn't run code. The result is energy savings over a traditional microcontroller that makes inference energy practically irrelevant. The shaded areas in this drawing represent energy spend for data input-output, data manipulation, and inference computation on a traditional microcontroller versus the Mac 78000. With the efficiency of the Mac 78000 accelerator, the predominant energy use is the microcontroller bringing input data onto and taking results off the chip, not the inference computation. Once this sinks in, the CNN accelerator efficiency motivates moving as much work as possible into the CNN network. This includes data manipulation, pre-processing normally performed on a microcontroller core. In the bar graphs, the gold data manipulation area for the Mac 78000 is smaller than the traditional microcontroller because we've pulled much of the pre-processing into the early layers of the CNN. We will now look at the Mac 78000 featherboard, its features, key components, and capabilities. The featherboard is one of several demonstration boards for the Mac 78000. It's small, but fully featured and it's affordable. This picture shows the featherboard in context of its size. It's based on the Adafruit Feather Development Board format and complies with the Feather physical dim dimensions and GPIO header pinouts. It's compatible with stackable feather wings and accessories. The key component, the Mac 78000, is front and center in the 8mm by 8mm 81 pin CTBGA package. Let's spend some time looking at the Mac 78000 Feather. The dimensions are 23 millimeters by 66 millimeters. Working clockwise from the Mac 78000 in the center of the board, button one and button two are user-defined push buttons that connect the Mac 78000 port pins through a Max 6817 signal debouncing IC. The standard 12-pin feather connector runs along the top of the board in this image, while the 16-pin feather connector runs along the bottom. They give access to power and ground rails, numerous digital I.O. functions, and two analog inputs. The onboard microphone is a MEMS digital microphone connected directly to the Mac 78000's I2S board. Additional support for audio is provided by the 3.5 millimeter line-in and line-out jacks that connect through a Max 9867 low-power stereo codec. These features make the Feather a great board for audio applications. For vision or image applications, 
an Omnivision OVM7692 VGA camera is provided. The board ships with a protective film over the camera, so be sure to remove it. The user LED is tricolor, illuminating as red, blue, or green. Other LEDs on the board, not called out in this drawing, are tricolor status LEDs for programming debug and power management. Programming and debug capability for the ARM Cortex M4 core is built in on the Feather by incorporating a MAX 32625 DAP-Link controller. This is the same controller used on the Maxim Pico board provided with many of our other kits. The push button DAP-Link update switch is used for updating the DAP-Link code when necessary. The 32-bit RISC-V core, primarily used as a smart DMA to load data into the CNN accelerator, is programmed and debugged via the RISC-V JTAG connector. The micro USB connector at the left is the primary power input and connects the MAC 78000 through the DAP-Link controller to provide both single wire debug and serial UART part connectivity. USB is also the power source for charging a single cell lithium ion battery when connected to the two pin JST PH battery connector. The default charge rate is set to a safe 51 milliamps and charging is controlled by the MAX 20303B power management IC, which also regulates supply voltages for the camera, microphone, other peripherals, and the input voltage to the MAC 78000's SIMO regulator. The power button wakes up the PMIC from power off while the reset push button directly resets the MAC 78000. Not shown on the back are a micro SD card socket and a QSPY SRAM. These provide a user-defined bulk data store for collecting audio or, or image samples, storing inference results, or other event logs. They can be used to store different CNN model parameters to perform multiple AI missions. Now we'll be looking at two examples of the Featherboard in action. The first video demonstrates keyword spotting. One second sound samples are processed to recognize 20 predefined keywords. The video shows the featherboard connected via USB to a PC and a terminal running to show statistics collected for each inference. Note the blue LED blinking when a word is detected and processed. The second video shows the Face ID demo running on, a, running on the onboard camera and an add-on display connected to the back of the featherboard. The model has been trained to extract facial features and calculate the distance of an image to a known set of faces. Out of the box, it can recognize 20 faces from the Celebrity A dataset, plus 10 more faces that the user can add. We'll look at videos of the demos running, then I'll cover more on the models and their performance. Up, down, left, right, stop, go, yes, no. This is Face ID demo running on Max 78000 feather board. It recognizes celebrity faces. Let's start. A big thank you to Victor Loganoff for help with the videos. This diagram shows the structure of the keyword spotting model. The input layer accepts one second of audio from the onboard digital microphone 
as a vector of 128 8-bit values. The first several layers replace the usual pre-processing performed in a DSP to create a spectrogram or MEL frequency septal coefficients. The MAX 78000 accelerator's parallel processes are faster and much lower power than the SIMD operations available from the ARM Cortex-M4. So why not use them? The remaining layers extract audio features, then flatten the output. The train network uses less than 30% of the MAX 78000 weight memory. This diagram shows the dimensions of the Face ID model, which takes a 120 by 160 color image from the onboard camera. In the first layer, 16 3x3 three three filters are applied to the RGB channels to expand the activation space to a 120 by 160 by 16 volume. In subsequent layers, max pooling shrinks the width and height dimensions, while Conv2D operations with additional filters increase the channel depth. This process extracts features and creates a 512 by 1 embedding at the output. A distance calculation is performed in the Cortex-M4 to arrive at a final result. If close to a known face, the image is recognized. If not, it is considered unknown. The, the train network uses only about 40% of the max 78,000 weight memory. Here are the speed and energy benchmarks for Keyword Spotting 20 and Face ID performed on the MAX 78000, a Cortex-M4 microcontroller running at 120 MHz, and a Cortex-M7 microcontroller running at 216 MHz. The Cortex-M4 micro is our own MAX 32650, which is an earlier low-power microcontroller product from the Maxim team that developed the Max 78000. Each device executes the same exact model on the same set of input samples for these tests. Keyword Spotting 20 is shown in teal. Face ID is in gold. The left graph shows inference time in milliseconds. The slower clock rate of the M4 is a significant contributor to its slower performance. The parallelism of the MAX 78000, up to 64 processors executing simultaneously, makes the inference time nearly disappear. The right graph shows inference energy in millijoules. The highly pipelined M7, plus the need for an external SD RAM, result in a very high energy use. Here, the MAX 78000 is so efficient that its energy use doesn't register at this scale. The table below provides numeric values for these tests. On average, the MAX 78000 is 100 times faster and lower energy than either microcontroller. We focus on inference time and energy per inference as meaningful metrics for IoT applications where inferences are not performed continuously. We found that completing an inference as quickly as possible, then returning to a low power state, is the best approach for lower overall system power. The MAX 78000 provides several low power modes to choose from depending on the system's wake-sleep timing. A thorough analysis of the power modes, along with energy measurements for audio and image loading, pre-processing, and other tasks, is covered in Application Note AN7417. Now it's time to talk about project ideas. There are many directions one can take with the Featherboard. Some a step away from our demos, and others that are ambitious leaps. Lots of choices to make. The type of input data audio, image, or perhaps multi-sensor time series data, where the model comes from, apply one of our pre-trained models in a new embedded application, retrain our models with a different data set, or develop and train your own model. 
Using the microphone, the keyword spotting model could be trained with a different word set or a different language. Perhaps it may, you could make a translator. Make it work for a domain-specific command set or improve robustness in noisy environments. How about spotting keywords for the he hearing impaired? Something to get their attention if someone is yelling, hey, watch out, or help. Also for audio, there's speaker recognition, acoustic scene classification, or sound event detection. Knocking on a door, glass breaking, sirens, a gunshot. Working with the camera, recognizing bird species, insects, or helping to sort components, maybe different types of bolts or screws. These are all possible. Detecting hand gestures or facial expressions too. Perhaps a different image sensor like a thermal camera or a LIDAR. There are many possibilities. I'd like to take a look at the development flow at a high level. Typically, the flow progresses sequentially from selecting a data set, adapting or designing a model, to training, code synthesis, and finally to deployment on the featherboard. In reality, the process is iterative, progressing forward, finding an obstacle, and then jumping back to overcome it. Examples are that data set samples may need to be resized to match the input of the model. Or the model may need additional layers or operations, maybe batch norm, to achieve training accuracy targets. Sometimes jumping back several steps is required. The data set may need more samples of an underrepresented class or you may need to take samples collected from the sensor on the target board to improve accuracy. A fundamental difference between human engineered and deep learning solution is the amount of data required. It's also critical to have the right data. Collecting and assembling a data set is not trivial. The data set must be curated so both usual and exceptional cases are represented adequately to train the model. Take a traffic light, for example. Creating a data set straight from video frames will result in many nearly identical images of the light when it's red and green, but many fewer when it's yellow. It's equally important to recognize yellow, even though it occurs infrequently. The likelihood that an object will be seen is irrelevant. It's the importance of recognizing an object or event that determines how well it must be represented in the database and how well the network must be trained to detect it. Speaking of training, robust recognition requires images in the training set for all conditions an object might be encountered. Indoors or other controlled environments are less challenging, but detecting objects outdoors requires training samples for a range of weather and lighting scenarios. Full sun, overcast, rain, snow, wind, perhaps additional scenarios for night. Don't leave out samples with the evening or morning sun shining from behind the object. Even something as simple as seeing red, green or yellow on a traffic light requires a lot of data. So where to get enough data? Start with open source data sets. You may want to look at data availability before you finalize your project choice. Once there is a good starting point, add to the data set using known data augmentation techniques and tools, such as OpenCV and others. Adding new instances of each sample that have been manipulated in various ways will multiply the number of dataset samples. For images, add various rotations, change contrast levels, saturation, hues, and object sizes. Do this especially for examples 
that are underrepresented in the original data set. For audio and other time series data, noise, interference, and distortion can be combined with pure samples to create a rich data set that trains a model to work well in adverse conditions. If possible, synthesize data to create or improve your data set. This is an option in only certain cases, but a very powerful one. It is also important to include data from the sensors used on the target system. Sensors have inherent imperfections. This is especially true if cost was a major factor in selecting the sensor. Retraining the network with data from the actual sensor will increase accuracy and robustness. It will likely happen towards the end of the project development cycle, when the final sensor or, or system is available. So where to get models? With a good project idea and data set identified, finding the model is the next challenge. This is no small feat. A first step is to look at the five models available on Maxim Integrated AI GitHub. These were created to demonstrate MNIST, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, Cats and Dogs, Face ID, and Keyword Spotting. They can also be used for other similar tasks. AI 5 Net, AI 5 Simple Net, and AI 5 CD Net are image classification models. AI Face ID Net creates an embedding of image characteristics. An AI-85 KWS V3 simulates a transform to a spectrogram, extracts features, and classifies the output. They can all be trained with a different data set to perform the same function, classification or embedding. Layers can be modified to accept different input dimensions or output a different number of classes. The boldest projects will require completely new models. This is where a fast GPU will really help. Instructions for adding new network models and new data set to the training process is documented on GitHub. Here's a quick look at the Maxim development tools hosted on GitHub in the training and synthesis repos. In the training repo, you'll find data sets, models, and scripts to evaluate and train the demos. The training workflow supports PyTorch and TensorFlow, though PyTorch is our primary DNN framework. Models provided by Maxim include pre-trained versions. If you're training your own model or retraining one of ours, a recent generation NVIDIA card is highly recommended. We also recommend Ubuntu 2004 LTS, Python 3.7 with CUDA 11. Any model that is designed to run on the Mac 78000 must use our customized NN.module classes. In a nutshell, these are layers consisting of Conv1D with up to 1x9 kernels and Conv2D with 1x1 or 3x3 kernels. Max pool and average pool element-wise operations, ReLU and AVS value activations. There's a complete list of predefined modules in AI85 training repo readme.md. Training uses floating point values for both weights and data, but is hardware aware, simulating the clipping behavior of the 8-bit Max 78000 cores. Quantization-aware training and post-training quantization are both supported. Configuration is on a per-layer basis, with mixed precision weights of 8-bit, 4-bit, 2-bit, and 1-bit available. Once training and evaluation are complete, a Trek checkpoint or Onyx file is output. In the synthesis step, the Network Loader, or ISER tool, generates embedded C code from the quantized checkpoint and Onyx file and a model description or sidecar file that assigns accelerator processors, their weight memories, 
and da data memory used to compute each layer. The ISER also includes a bit accurate simulator to confirm performance prior to deployment. Available resources. There are numerous resources available to enable deployment on the MAX 78000 Feather. We suggest you start with MaximIntegrated.com for the data sheets on the MAX 78000 and the MAX 78000 Feather board. There are also several app notes that explain details on using the part. Next is GitHub. There are several repos organized under Maxim Integrated AI. Start with the documentation repo. This has links to getting started guides and the rest of our documentation and tools. More videos are available on YouTube from Maxim and TinyML. A detailed walkthrough of our development tools is available. We've been recently honored with several awards for the MAX 78000. It's been great talking today. I hope that I was able to generate some interest in diving in with the MAX 78000 Feather. Thank you for taking the time to listen. We'll now be taking questions live. Okay, thank you, Brian, for um, your presentation. As Brian said, we will now try to uh, answer your questions. So here we have one. Well, yes, I think you can detect vehicles. Um, it, there's a lot of other considerations. Um, you know what what the accuracy and and what the latency is. Um, this this is not, you know, this this level of of performance is not aimed at self driving and, and those kinds of things. I will will make that comment. Yes, I, as I understood it, the Max seventy eight thousand is uh, also intended for wearables, etc. So not so much for uh, uh, application inside cars and uh, small portable. Right, right. right. So, yeah, we're we're um, at the very low power end. Um, you know, so something that would operate off of either uh, you know a couple of alkaline batteries or a very small lithium ion battery. Um, you know, for, for days, weeks, uh, the inference cycle is, is somewhat long, maybe even months. Okay. Here we have a question about the risk five core. Yes. So this is a, uh, 32 bit, uh, risk core, um, that was adapted from the, um, the uh, pulp uh, group. So it's um, in in this part. It's meant for data loading and unloading. Um, you know anything that the RISC five core can do, the 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 Cortex M four can do as well. And it's when you either want to get lower power than the Cortex M four, or the Cortex M four is busy doing something else. Eye movement and positioning is it is it fast enough to detect eye movements? Um, yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, we don't know what all your performance parameters are, but uh, but but yeah. And then we do have a faster product coming out. It's in the development pipeline now. Also low power. Yeah, so not it's faster than this one, so it's not quite as low power, but but it is this similar architecture and then similar design techniques to to minimize power. Okay. We have a question from Johan van den Arendt. Is it solid state or does it run a kind of operating system? Yeah, so it is solid state. Um, and, and when I'm saying it, I'm really referring to the CNN accelerator. Block. So it's it is a state machine. Um, so what happens is is it's configured with uh, the layer definitions and the weights, and it it's just hardwired logic, you know, based on on the layer uh, layer configuration and the weights, and it just runs uh, layer by layer through uh, the convolution operation. Um, the uh, the ARM Cortex M4, yeah, you could have some sort of a, a you know lightweight RTOS or something. Okay, here's a bit mysterious question for me. 
Okay, so mobile net uh, is for this part is a little bit too large to fit. So there are variants of it that have been optimized and trimmed down uh, that are that are able to run on this. So uh, we've been working with some some model experts, development partners uh, to to get there. So you can look at maximintegrated.com. Uh, we've got parts, we've got the feather boards, we have our larger EV kit there uh, as well. So they're, they're all available for purchase. And of course, uh, not to forget to, to mention it, um, you can win one if you join the contest, of course. Eh? So then you don't have to buy it. Yes, and I think, I think Elector has an enhanced kit as, as well on their site. Uh, I know we are working on a book also about it. Yes, there's several several good articles on Elector, and there is a book coming out. Yes, yes, we have published several articles, and a book is being worked on. Um, you can find the articles on our website, of course. Uh, next question. Would it be feasible to detect a single vehicle approaching? Um, yes, I, it, it will. Um, you know, again, it's... It's all of the other things that you have to think about are, you know, what what are all of the uh, different kinds of conditions that you have to, um, you know, worry about? Is it different weather? If it's at different uh, lighting conditions, uh, things like that. What will be the price of the chip? Yeah, so we do have a published price on our website of $8.50 for 1K pieces. And uh, you know we'll would be happy to talk to anybody that's got you know a larger project and and see what kind of flexibility we can do. Mm -hmm. Can the Max seventy eight thousand handle real time video processing? So this is gonna uh, this is gonna involve knowing like what the the resolution of the video is. You know, with a VGA uh, resolution, we're probably at about one frame per second with this device. Um, the, the next device, I would say, is is more of a real-time video processor. Okay. I tried the cats and dogs uh, detection demo, and that works in real time. But it's not very fast, of course, but it, it works in real time. Yeah. So I mean, within the within the the CNN engine itself, the resolutions are are you know much smaller than VGA. Um, that's that's typical of of uh, most devices like this. So um, you know, the first few layers are going to be um, downsampling the the input image. And um, if you look at our examples, uh, you'll see that. We're taking in, you know, typically a uh, quarter, quarter, quarter VGA type of uh, image, and then downsampling it into the intermediate layers. Okay. And a question about models. Um, so it is possible um, to to swap the models. Um, you know, like on the feather board, uh, there's the, um, you know, the SD card slot on the back. So you could have multiple models in there. Um, and then, you know, one of the schemes for low power that we look at is the time between inferences. And if it's very long, we actually suggest uh, loading the model before each inference, because then in the intermediate, intermediate time, you can, you can, uh, spend that at a much lower power uh, level, so you don't have to maintain uh, the model SRAM. So uh, it's not necessarily fixed on boot. So there, there's lots of flexibility there. Any document latency data? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, for all of our models, uh, we uh, you know. We, we do produce the, the latency data. I, I'm sure you probably didn't catch it on um, the, the video of the keyword spotting, but it was showing latency data there. Uh, that AN7417 app note has latency data. And I just wanted to comment on one thing is that, you know, with this being a state machine, the latency is, is fairly well behaved. 
Uh, you know, there is some variation depending on the input data, uh, but it's but it's fairly consistent, and and we are coming up with uh, a model uh, to predict it. Um, there is one question left, the last one for the moment. So um, I think that really has to do with how ambitious your your project is. Um, if, if you take a look at just some uh, some basic um background on machine learning uh deep neural networks uh convolutional neural networks um our uh our demonstrator uh models and uh, and uh code I, I think you could uh you could get going with it depends on your background we kind of find that people have either have a machine learning background and struggle with the embedded or they have an embedded background and struggle a little bit with the machine learning. But we have complete examples there um, so that you, you can load them and run them uh, right out of the box. Um, and then if you want, you can, you can do some retraining of the models. Um, you know, that's sort of alluded in the, in the uh, presentation. Then, you know, maybe one step is to find a, a slightly different uh, data set and, so you use the same model, but you train it with a slightly different data set. Um, and then, you know, you can you can do something very bold, which is design your own model. Yeah, I found I had to play with the keyword uh, spotting demo. And actually, if you can come up with an application that fits in the vocabulary of the demo, then you just use this uh, example and you add the, the code you need to control your thing. And so you don't need any prior knowledge at all. You just have to know how to compile it. Uh, that worked very fine for me, actually. Yeah, so it, it would be really easy to just use that and and uh, maybe make some kind of a translator, um, you know, so, something like that with a different set of keywords. Back to the risk 5 which tools do you recommend for the risk five? So we have a tool chain for the risk five. Uh, I think we've, we've got it for both uh, windows and Linux. Uh, we, we tend to do more of our team does things in Linux than, than in windows. Um, but, but we have uh, support for both. All right. So this is a good question. Um, so a lot of the work can be done in windows. However, um, you know, when you look at doing any of the uh, model training, that's all really Linux based. Py, it's PyTorch or TensorFlow, and that's all really Linux based. Now you can do that uh, with the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, and, and when I say you can do it, you can, but it's gonna be very slow because ultimately if you're really training a model, you're going to want a machine that has, uh, you know, a, a good NVIDIA card, a, a recent NVIDIA card, and uh, and to get the most performance, you're going to be wanting to run that on on uh, on Linux. Now we do have people who do some retraining of the models on their Windows platforms, and so instead of things taking, you know, two or three hours, they take, you know, ten or twenty hours, uh, things things like that, and. And really, when we're retraining uh, or training a, a new model, I mean, the training can go on for, uh, you know, per, perhaps a couple of days. So that, that's just sort of the, the world we're living in right now with, uh, you know, with artificial intelligence models. Um, I don't see any new questions. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian and Robert, for being with us and all your other colleagues also who are uh, behind the scenes, actually. Uh, I can see them. But what else can? Um, thank you, participant, for being with us also this afternoon. I hope you learned a lot from this webinar. I hope you will uh, it will be useful for you in uh, doing your um, AI project, your Max 78000 project. So thank you very much. I uh, do not have an another webinar to announce, so um, we will see you next time at, when we know we have a new webinar. Uh, goodbye. Thank you, Clemens.